the Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network presents The Roots of Reconstruction by Rusas John Rushduni Narrated by Shelby Luke Thank you for joining me this week in the reading of Roots of Reconstruction by Rusus John Rushduni. In lieu of the judgment of God across this nation, I appeal to you to listen, learn, and live as the Holy Spirit guides you in the truth of the Word of God. The words and prompting of fallible men do not hold a candle to the truth of Scripture, and the truth of Scripture will only be words to our ears unless we exhort, establish, and exercise these infallible words in every area of thought and life. Calcine Report number 82, June 1972. Despite their differences, which are very real, our political left and right have much in common. They are concerned in varying ways with peace and with law and order. The left, militant in its hostility to the war in Vietnam, has international law and order in mind. Granted that many of the recent demonstrations against the war have been communist-controlled, as Mayor Yorty of Los Angeles proved, they clearly have a popular following because the hostility to the war is very deep. The hostility has good constitutional grounds, moreover. According to the U.S. Constitution, a drafted army or militia can only be used to repel invasion, suppress insurrection, and enforce the laws of the Union, not for a foreign war. Those conservatives who favor the war are thus as lax in their use of the Constitution as the U.S. Supreme Court, and they contribute to the erosion of the law. The conservatives, on the other hand, also want peace and law and order. They maintain that international law and order depend on defeating communism. Nationally, it means strict law enforcement and here they are able to score against the left for its lax use of the law and the attendant erosion of the vitality of the law. They can point to the steady disintegration of social order, the increase of crime, and the widely prevalent disrespect for law. The reigning liberals are no less concerned with peace and with law and order, although their definitions would not agree with those of the left and right. Their involvement in Vietnam, according to every president from Kennedy to Nixon, has been a peacemaking involvement. Their attempts to gain internal peace are very prominent, although they are in effect the same as their international efforts, namely to gain peace by buying peace. Concessions are made to the communists, to minority groups, to capital and to labor, both to buy support and also to buy peace. The principle is simply the old idea that a tiger with a full stomach is safer to live with than a hungry one. The hope, in fact, is that the satiated tiger can be turned into a pussycat with constant stuffing. But peace on all sides is a common goal, however differently sought. Men are weary with trouble, tension, and the growing lack of safety for man in his own home or on his own street. This situation is not new. Mattingly gives us a telling insight into the attitude of the people of the Roman Empire. Peace is the boon that is most steadily and fervently desired, for on it depend such possibilities of the good life as the empire can still offer. Liberty is still valued, but no longer as the supreme good, it is never for long in the foreground. The empire gave stability and rest to a weary and aging world. Harold Mattingly the Man in the Roman Street, page 111, New York, W.W. W. Norton, 1966. The Romans, Mattingly points out, had, quote, a great absorption in the present with a vast respect for the past, unquote. They had less interest in the future. Quote, the rapture of the forward view is very hard to find in any corner of the Roman Empire, unquote. The Roman concern was to maintain what they had, not to work and plan for a greater future. Abid, pages 137, 141F, and 149. As a result, despite the lack of any real enemy other than itself, Rome fell. 
It had only one future-oriented element, the Christians, who then built a new civilization. The people of Rome wanted peace with law and order, and Rome was less and less able to deliver it. Today, the failure of the state to give peace is everywhere apparent. The goals of most people are limited ones, simply to be given enough law and order to enjoy what they have in peace. If they could turn the clock back 20 years, they would be very happy. But people whose goal is peace rarely enjoy it. Peace is a product of true victory. And law and order cannot flourish unless, first of all, there is theological law and philosophical order. People today want the fruits of peace, not the roots. Where people long for peace rather than victory and progress, there also a distorted vision prevails. This distorted vision governed many American writers of the 19th century. They had broken with the Puritan faith of their fathers and were hostile to the America it had produced. As a result, Many of them could see little good in the United States and everything evil. Still surrounded by forests, streams, and a continent of rich resources, they looked all the same to other shores for their paradise and hope. Herman Melville in Clarel spoke of Tahiti as the only fit place on earth for the advent of Christ. But both the authorities Melville used and his own knowledge confirmed the fact that the South Sea Islands were no paradise less so then than now. The islands were marked, Baird tells us, quote, by filth and disease, idiocy and cruelty. They had plagues of stinging flies, fetid heat, odor around the dwelling places, filth and vermin over the food, and so on, unquote. William Ellis reported that on an island near Tahiti he had seen a hungry child given a piece of her own father's flesh for nourishment. Lieutenant Wise, following Melville on Nukahiva, saw the chief's brother, drunk with Ava, coiled upon a bed of filthy mats, half dead with some loathsome disease. James Baird, Ishmael, A Study of the Symbolic Mode in Primitivism, page 120F, New York. Harper Torch Books, 1960. Somewhat later, Gauguin, while admitting that Tahitian women were not beautiful, properly speaking, still held that they had an indefinable quality, quote, of penetrating the mysteries of the infinite, unquote, page 149. Both Melville and Gauguin failed to see the potentialities of their respective countries and look for the impossible in the South Seas, and impose their imagination on a world they would not face realistically. This same imposition of dreams on to an ugly reality has been common among travelers to the communist countries. They see no good in their country and see the Marxist states in the light of their imagination. When men place peace above other considerations, they are unwilling to face up to anything which tells them that their dream is a futile one. They are ready then to compromise truth in order to gain peace, because they are weary of the struggle. But peace, like happiness, always eludes men when they make it a goal of human endeavor. Peace and happiness are byproducts of other goals. We cannot make ourselves truly happy by deciding we need to be happy. Happiness is a product of work well done of a life lived in successful community, of peace with God, and of much more. Men make happiness a goal when they have failed miserably in all other objectives, and what they then mean by happiness is really an archetized state wherein they feel no griefs and can enjoy some very limited pleasures of play. Similarly, peace is a byproduct of a general success in one's relationships to God and man and one's calling and in a confident prospect concerning the future. Peace implies a harmony of affairs and a general harmony of personal and social interest. What most people mean by peace is an attitude of leave me alone and don't bother me with the problems of the world or do anything but get rid of all these problems and leave me to enjoy myself. Peace in this sense is a retreat. It is more than that. It is a form of suicide a surrender of life for a retirement to the sidelines of life. 
Unfortunately for these people, the world is now moving towards a radical confrontation of man by the basic issues and problems of life. All the postponed problems, the deferred and pressing debts of life are beginning to fall due and are demanding attention. The luxury of indifference is fast waning. Church members who left the defense of the faith to their clergy are now finding that God is requiring them to defend their faith or to surrender it. The state, which has been promising man more and more cradle to grave or womb to tomb, security is less and less able to deliver any kind of security. A radio announcement today by a presidential candidate asked, Are you tired of phonies in political office? Then vote for me. The appeal of this approach has been great, and the reason is an obvious one. Any politician who offers man peace and security will offer thereby a fraudulent claim, so that a contender can always impugn his integrity in order to gain office. He, in turn, will be regarded as equally a fraud, because no politician can deliver what God himself alone can give, and does not give more than a limited amount of in this world. Psalms 24.2 tells us something about the world and our life in it, which men prefer to forget. Quote, For he hath founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. Unquote. This is a very precarious foundation for life. The seas and the floods are places for alert and steady movement, not a peaceful standing still. History is a battlefield and it calls for action to victory. There is peace and order in the graveyard, not on the firing line. A culture or civilization which thinks first of peace is most certain to have war and death because it has lost its will to live. In the midst of a Roman empire dedicated to peace and security, oblivious of the future and trying to hold on to the remnants of the past, one element was future-oriented and able to command the day, the Christians. For long years now, the church has been asleep, clergy and laity alike. The widespread apostasy of the clergy is forcing many of the laity out of their slumbers. If the faith is to be defended, they must do it. The result is a spreading revival of doctrinal concern, a reawakening of faith, prayer, and action, and a readiness to stand for the faith which did not exist twenty years ago. The old forms are crumbling, perhaps because they must. Old wineskins cannot contain new wine. The oldest and most worn of the old wineskins is the humanistic state, the state as man's savior has tried desperately to give man that peace and security which its political lullabies have promised. However, even its pampered brats of the academic community are awake and squalling. The things the modern state least provides are those it most promises, peace and security, and in the growing monetary crisis, its ability to give even a measure of these is limited. We live in a momentous and exciting era, a turning point in history. Before the healing rains come, the sky always darkens and the thunder and lightning are very much in evidence. We are not in the wintertime of the world, but in its spring. Wise men will plant for the future. Calcine Report number 83 July 1972. Webster's New International Dictionary in its supposedly conservative second edition defined totalitarian thus, quote, of or pertaining to a highly centralized government under the control of a political group which allows no recognition of or representation to other political parties, as in fascist Italy or in Germany under the Nazi regime, unquote. Several things are wrong with this definition, which is a good example of the fact that even good dictionaries do not always define either too honestly or too well. First of all, the definition is slanted when it comes to citing examples, in that it omits the major totalitarian state, the Soviet Union. Second, and more important, the definition is purely political. Is it of the essence of totalitarianism that it allows no representation or freedom for other political parties, or is it not rather that it allows no freedom for any element of society at all? Third, and closely related to this, 
The definition simply ignores the word defined, totalitarian. The word means that the totality of life, men, property, religion, education, and all else are controlled by the state. Just as God, as sovereign Lord and Creator, absolutely governs and ordains all things by His omnipotent counsel and decree, so the totalitarian state plays God and by its total plan seeks to govern every aspect of life and to conform it to its purposes. Totalitarianism is not new in history. What is new is the added potential for total power which modern communications and transportation media give to the totalitarian state. Ancient Egypt and many states since have been the totalitarian. The sovereign and absolute government of God over all things is one that institutions and aspects of the created order have again and again claimed and sought to arrogate to themselves. It is important to analyze some of these totalitarian claims and attempts in order to understand the issue more clearly. Very clearly, the church in the, quote, medieval, unquote, era did declare itself to be the kingdom of God and the umbrella over all society and all things therein, so that some have referred to the church then as having been totalitarian. It is easy to see the faults of another era, less easy sometimes to see our own in perspective. The 20th century has already seen, it is said, the death of 100 million people by torture, famine, war, and forced labor. The quote medieval unquote church at its worst was not totalitarian in the strict sense of the word because its faith required a denial of any such claim and that God alone is sovereign Lord and governor of all things. The creed of the church was a witness against every false churchman. It asserted the transcendental supernatural nature and origin of God's absolute government so that there was always a built-in judgment against false churchmen. This is very important. True totalitarianism must deny God's transcendental government, law, and counsel. The origin of all things must be here and now, in the universe, within the grasp of man. Totalitarianism and eminence go hand in hand. A philosophy of eminence holds that all essence, being, and power are fully present in the world and exclusively in the world so that the world is fully governed by its own inherent nature and potentiality. From Hegel through Marx and Darwin, the modern philosophy of eminence received its great expression and made possible modern totalitarianism. Earlier, many areas of science had been totalitarian in their philosophies. Thus, physicists sought and some still seek to reduce all reality to physics. Mathematicians of an earlier day would only allow a god who was the great mathematician, that is, the built-in cosmic computer of the universe. Reality, in brief, was reduced to a particular institution or discipline of which men were the governors or interpreters. This same fallacy has marked economics in that all too many free market advocates under the influence of a philosophy of emantism have taken this one sphere of law and absolutized it as the only law. We do agree with classical economics as economics, but not as a religious philosophy. When it is converted into a religious philosophy of eminence, it denies validity to any transcendental law of God and to all other institutions and orders of life unless they pass the test of the free market. Free market economics then becomes totalitarian and absolutist. It becomes idolatry. Some hold that the family and prostitution and normal and perverted sexuality must compete on a free market basis. Narcotics and good food are reduced to the same free market test. In brief, anything and everything goes, because there is only one law, the free market, and only one value, the free market. One person contends that there should be no title to property, but only the right of access by everyone who is able to command the power and money 
to take the property. In other words, a free market for power and violence as well. Any value derived from any other sphere or any principled judgment derived from a transcendental order from God must compete on a free market basis it is held. This is simply saying that the free market is God and that it is the absolute and sole value in the universe. It assumes that there is no God beyond the market, no other law, no other value than the free market. Moreover, because the free market has its truth in the economic sphere, they sit back smugly, satisfied that they have the key to life. The Marxists, no less than other totalitarians, stress one or two partial, quote, truths, unquote, which they use to exclude all truth and God, and the same is true of those who reduce the world to matter. The free market religionist are really great enemies of free market economics in that they pervert an instrument of freedom into a form of totalitarianism. It is not surprising that many free market religionists have in recent years been very congenial to the new left. Both are alike in their strident totalitarianism. The political religionists, however, are far more numerous. They believe in salvation by the state, and even when democratic or republican in their governmental forms, they are essentially totalitarian. Contrary to Webster's Dictionary, a state can have many political parties and still be totalitarian. Let us examine how this is possible. First, a totalitarian state either denies God or ignores Him because it is, to all practical intent, the ultimate power in its universe. By denying or ignoring the transcendental and sovereign God, a state makes a major and decisive step into totalitarianism. It says, in effect, quote, I am God, and beside me there is no other power in my realm. Unquote. Second, a totalitarian state, having denied God, assumes the role of God by taking control over every area of life, education, health, welfare, the family, the church, private associations, and all things else. As the predestinating God, the state insists on working out a plan for every area of life, and it progressively requires strict obedience to that plan. The plan represents the godlike wisdom of the state in its concern for its creatures, and to oppose the plan is to be seen as a devil and an enemy of the state. Third, this means, of course, that for political religionists, all the problems of life can be solved by political action, by and through the state. This requires the control of science, medicine, property, money, education, and everything so that the state can marshal all its powers to overcome the obstacle at hand. Not surprisingly, politicians speak of the conquest of war, ignorance, poverty, disease, and even death as legitimate objects of statist action. If all power is of this world, not of God, then all answers are of this world and from man organized as the state. Because it is believed that total power is in man, total power is sought in and through man's great agency, the state. Fourth, as long as the people of the state are largely political religionists, people who believe in salvation by politics, all their political parties will share this faith. In virtually every country today, political parties, whatever their differences on methods and measures, do believe in salvation by politics. Theirs is a statist totalitarianism as against the free market religionist totalitarianism of the marketplace. Quite rightly, therefore, Huntford speaks of Sweden, which has more than one political party, as totalitarian, and he sees the same elements of totalitarianism in varying degrees in other Western nations. In his very important study, he sees Sweden as an approximation of Aldous Huxley's Brave New World, and the rest of the West as nations in quest of the same goal. Roland Huntford, The New Totalitarians, New York, Stein and Day, 1972. 
The only valid answer to totalitarianism of every variety is a biblical faith which denies all philosophies of eminence and holds to the sovereignty of the triune God. The ultimate standard, power, and authority in the universe resides not in the state, nor the marketplace, nor in physics, mathematics, nor in anything else which pertains to the created order. To God alone belongs dominion, power, and authority. There is no ultimacy in the created universe, only change, the possibilities of change, either to grow or to decline, and sin, a transgression of God's law and order. There is also obedience, the possibility of progress towards God's purpose for us, purposeful growth toward an established goal. There is moreover freedom, since ultimacy belongs to God, only God can bind man by his decree. Man has no right to bind his fellow man by any man-made concept or law. Only God's law is binding. Man is thus freed from his worst oppressor, man. A philosophy of eminence leads to totalitarianism because it places all power and authority in the present order of things, and it gives man no supreme court of appeals in God against the world. Wherever and whenever a philosophy of eminence has governed men to any degree, to that degree totalitarian tyranny has also governed men. The power of the modern state is very great, and it is totalitarian, but it rests on a false faith. That faith is crumbling now, but it is not enough for men to become bitter at a particular form of totalitarianism. They must reject the faith which undergirds it, which means that they must reject it first in themselves. It also means more than a humanistic and pietistic return to religion. Men have often looked to God as a life raft, a spare tire, an insurance policy in case of trouble, or as an aid to life. In a very humanistic bit of advertising, we are told that, quote, the family that prays together stays together, unquote. True enough, but is that the purpose of praying? And is it not an offense to the sovereign God to see the purpose of prayer merely as family togetherness? The triune God must above all else be for us the sovereign Lord, authority, and power whom we serve and obey because it is the essence and requirement of life to do so. Quote, Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Unquote. The power of the God with whom we have to do is not the blundering, brutal power of man and the state, but an all-wise, all-holy government, which is mindful of every hair of our head, Matthew 10.30, and whose victory and purpose are assured. Life has always been a time of testing, and it is no less so now. It is also a time of choosing, a time when men choose and are chosen, when men reveal what they are, and then move in terms of it. If we are governed by our fears of men, then we are governed by men. And if we are governed by our humanistic love of man, then we are governed by man. Quote, the fear of man bringeth the snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. Unquote. Proverbs 29.25 How safe are you? There is nothing in our creeds about defeat. Rather, in the glorious words of the Benedictus, God, quote, hath raised up an horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us, that we, being delivered out of the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life, unquote. Luke 1, 71 74 and 75. Having this assurance, St. Paul declared, quote, Rejoice in the Lord alway, and again I say, Rejoice. Unquote. Philippians 4 4. Thank you for joining me this week in the reading of Roots of Reconstruction by Bruce's John Rushman. Lord willing, we will be reading again next week. Until then, may God bless your endeavors as you serve the one and only King Jesus. It was the blood of Jesus, the perfect sacrifice, the love he had shown us by his pain, the very prize. It was there.
Calvary's tree, where he died for you and me. And if love he deserves, we should. The Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network brings to you a complete lineup of podcasts where you will hear practical and tactical theology. Our desire is not simply that you consume our shows, but that you also live out your faith in every area of life. We can talk all day long about these things, but if we fail to put them into practice, then we fail as ambassadors of Jesus Christ our King. Subscribe now to your favorite Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network shows. Or you can subscribe to the Reconstructionist Radio Master Feed, where all of the content we produce, including the audiobooks and audio articles, will pop up as soon as they are available. And don't forget to visit ReconstructionistRadio.com to volunteer as a narrator or to partner with this ministry financially. May the Holy Spirit stir you into action for Christ and His kingdom.